brief you where do you stand the 1992 constitution are you for a comprehensive review of the constitution or just pick and choose aspects of uh, it for our purposes then my third you are concerned as i'm concerned and mr speaker that would be my only question for him the rest are commentary uh, this one will be my question how do we end and manage or deal together with civil society and the Ghanaian public and political parties the monetization of our election processes and the threat it poses to the sustenance of multi-party constitutional democracy yes i know all the political parties ndc and pp are guilty of it but i'm using the yardstick of the last mpp primaries and the heavy doses of money we saw many of our friends collapsing to that hemorrhaging uh, cost of uh, money so that would be my only question for you to do the other one would be a comment uh, how do we work together to strengthen uh, parliament and then also to tease your mind as i have said i have no direction for you one of the weakness of our parliament in the exercise of oversight is the rush with which successive governments ndc mpp have subjected parliament to you bring in a bill you are suspending the standing orders stakeholders are not being consulted persons affected by the legislation or likely to be affected are not involved in the process and you come in with a loan facility of one billion thanks to a public financial management system you expect it to pass within 24 hours without scrutiny you are free to comment on any of this i have no doubt that you are capable and capable of playing any role i look forward to a better and a strengthened relationship between the executive and parliament but as to equal arms of government that is where you should lead co-equal arms of government not one subservient to the other or subservient to the executive Mr. chairman i would not have except the monetization issue the rest maybe he wants to communicate with the rest of the world and the Ghanaian public what his enormous experience can benefit the people of Ghana and our democracy. I thank you, Chair. Mr. Chairman, um, let me let me also thank the minority leader, the ranking member of the committee for the kind words. Um, the one issue about constitutional review, uh, he knows my opinion. And I think I don't believe in, you know, just tinkering with the Constitution. I believe that there should be a holistic review of the Constitution. We are in Parliament, we have applied the Constitution, and indeed we apply it on a daily basis. We know the weaknesses that confront us in areas, in many areas, including even what he is alluding to, the process of amending the Constitution, uh, especially the entrenched ones, we seem to relegate the um, Parliament to the backyard. Even with the non-entrenched, what's our uh, properly definable. So Parliament as an arm of government will have many issues. Uh, you you even speak about the the um, the bringing agreements and bills to Parliament. And sometimes we'll have to uh, set aside some of the orders. The constitution is always uh, a bit confused about what to do when we have to abridge the process. You would realize, my, my colleague, that when you refer to um, Article 106, I think, Article 106, 
we do it with the, the mode of exercising legislative power. Just look at it. When we come to um, Clause 30, which provides where it is determined by a committee of parliament appointed for the purpose that the particular bill is of urgent nature, the provisions of the preceding of the preceding clauses of this article, other than clause one and paragraph A of clause two, shall not apply. And accordingly, the president shall give his assent to the bill on his presentation for assent. <laughs> what does it mean? What it means is that the article 1061 would apply, 1062 would apply. Uh, 2A would apply. It says the preceding clauses except 1 and 2A. So the publication in the Gazette would not apply. And when we talk that, that is the main issue. If you come to 3, it talks about a bill affecting the institution of chiefs which shall not be introduced in Parliament without prior reference to the National House of Chiefs. Does it mean that in an urgent situation, one can waive that? 1063, there's that unclarity. 1064 then relates to the processes, that is, first reading, second reading, the concentration stage, third reading, and so on. It says that all these should be, should be um, suspended. What does it mean? How does the bill enter Parliament in the first place if it is not read for the first time? So there's that unclarity and confusion. And I think that we should have a holistic view of this, uh, of the Constitution. In much the same way, if we relate it to the judiciary, they'll have their own, they'll have their own issues, the constitutional creatures. You remember uh, my distinguished colleague, when at the point in time we had to um, bring in, the president had to bring in Shabbat say in place of um, a Farijan who had retired. My position at the time was that we should have the president submit the names to us for parliament to subject it to prior approval using two thirds. When it comes to parliament approving by two thirds, the president will be forced to be very much more consultative in the appointment than is usually the case. That was just a suggestion. Today, commissioners and commissioners who are appointed by the president are undermined because of uh, maybe lack of trust. And the NDC thinks that because the current commissioners were introduced by President Kufuabu's regime, they cannot trust them. Just as we thought, Tamasai's commission could not be trusted. What should be the way forward for us as a country? Or should we go on in this haranguing all the time when there's a new set of commissioners? I think there should be a better way for us as a country. And as I'm saying, if we left it to all of us, strum out the critical issues contained in the Constitution and elevate them to a national debate, from which perhaps be born a consultative assembly or a constituent assembly. Then something will come out, which we shall subject to referendum. And then whatever the agreement is, that will be the new constitution for us. So I think that it should not just be a tinkering with the constitution. There should be a holistic and indeed wholesale review. The issue about um, high attrition rate and monetization of the election process. You've heard me, um, the Honorable Ranking Member and Minority Leader, on many, many occasions. I think that there's no person in politics who is a father Christmas, and I keep insisting on this, that in politics, one people show today you will not have the patience to wait until one year or two years before they, they, they want to harvest. They saw today they want to harvest the, the day after today. 
The process, we should all admit, is from the very beginnings where uh, we engage in, my party engages in the election of police station executives. That's where it starts from. Then we come to the electoral area, we come to constituency, then we come to regional, then we go to national. I refer us to Article 55.5 of the Constitution, which provides that the, the, um, the, the chairman, if you permit me, 55.5, which provides that the internal organization of a political party shall conform to democratic principles and its actions and purposes shall not contravene or be inconsistent with this Constitution or any other law. On account of this, some people think that at every level of the structures of the party, there should be elections. I disagree. I disagree. Because the same, the same um, article in Clause 9 says that the members of the National Executive Committee of a political party shall be chosen from all the regions of Ghana. Now, by these elections that we conduct, how are we able to constitute the National Executive of the Party to reflect membership from all the regions in this country? We are not able to do that. Yeah, good. The language in the Constitution is they shall be chosen. Of course, election is one means of choosing people. But election is not the only means. Popular acclamation is a means of choosing people. Appointment is a means of choosing. So until we come to some understanding on this, we shall have problems. And it reflects in the in the um, in choosing parliamentary countries as well. In the established democracies, at the end of the term of a parliament, nowhere in the established democracies do you have what is happening in, what is happening in Ghana, that the sleeves gates are opened and anybody can enter. Democracy everywhere is guided and guarded. And until we come to that understanding and open the sluice gates every four years, this monetization would it will become difficult for us to banish it. Because elsewhere, the parliamentary parties assess the performance of the MPs and pass on the recommendations to the party. This person is doing so well. And minority leader, you mentioned a certain person called uh, Ben Abdallah. You know what he was doing for this house and for country? He spoke about Dr. Sibeyeboa. And we all know the, the contributions of a certain Fuseni Inusa, of the lecture. Today, they are not all part of us. They are not part of us because of certain frustrations. Some of them went into primaries and lost. So, for how long are we going to continue in this process? And we all know that a lot of the considerations is not really what a person does in Parliament, but some other considerations that have nothing to do with the performance of business in this house. So that's where it starts from. And I think that not until the parties confront this reality, it will be difficult to stop the tide of the high attrition rate. Um, I think they have, have attempted to answer the question on the ration of bills through Parliament. And um, the other one is how to work together. Australian Parliament. I think we are in that enterprise together. We are not here. Okay, we will continue to be in that enterprise together. We have kept you here long enough. They said we have kept you here long enough. As our leader. For our leader. Um, we thank you for turning up on the house. We are always in touch with it. We harass you from morning till evening till we get what we want. So we are sure that we will continue to be with you and after you for the things that ha the parliament needs. Chairman, but what is the meaning of Sumpahine and Sumpahima? 
And is it spelled with a U or O? As what? F M O. Java. Som som S O M is to say. So Shumpa Henny is the chief of goods, the person who renders good service in the community. Right. Just so as of, my wife. Chief of servants. Just, just so as my wife has also been installed as Sumpahima. I'm not feeling the good service. In what respect? So here, Mr. Speaker, Suhini, I mean, Suhini has his view on other considerations that I don't want to involve myself in. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You understand, the honorable leader. You hear from us. Ernest, nobody, please.
the setting is so informal that the things we can go around. <laughs> Can they administer their speech? I, I, Godfrey, you want damage. Swear by the Almighty God. Swear by the Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give before this committee. That the evidence I shall give before this committee. Touching the matter in issue. Touching the matter in issue. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me. God. So help me, God. <laughs> Mr. Godfrey, your boy, Dam. On behalf of the court, I congratulate you on your nomination as the Attorney General in elevation. The last dispensation you were a deputy. Now you've been made the substantive, you've nominated as a substantive attorney general. We voted you once before. If some things have changed, we would like to hear them. But otherwise, tell us very briefly about yourself. Kindly speak to the mic. Press the button. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My name is Godfrey Yabo Adame. I was born on 15, 1979. I hail from Wenchi, the Bronx region. I had my primary education at Cape Coast at Versailles Memorial Preparatory School. I had only one year of my primary education at Commander College Party School. I proceeded to Adisade College to pursue my ordinary level and advanced level certificate. I completed the O level in 94, A level in 96, and I proceeded to the University of Ghana to pursue my Bachelor of Law degree from 1998 to 2001. But before then, I had my national service at the KEA district. After the national service, there was one year of strike, and for that matter, I had to engage in teaching at a village called Grassy, also in the KEA district. After 2001, I went to Ghana Law School, October 2001, completed in 2003 with a professional law certificate. The chairman, I pursued my national service in this honorable house, completed it in May or June 2004. I did my pupillage at Ekufaud Open Co. concurrently from October 2003 to 2004, um, June. I continued with my professional practice at Kufa Di Pempe and Co. Indeed, I was there apart from 2006, where I had to pursue a course at Oxford University Programming uh, Compatible Media Law and Policy. I returned to pursue my professional, my, to carry on with my law practice at Kufa Di Pempe and Co. I was engaged in private law practice until March 2017, when I was nominated by. 2017, I was mentioned by the President as Deputy Attorney General and Deputy Minister for Justice. I was approved by this Honorable House and I was sworn into office on 24th April 2017 and I stayed in that office until 6 January 2021. I was, by the gift of God, nominated again by the President this time for the office for which I'm being vetted this morning. I'm a Christian. I worship regularly at the Legon Administration Church. I'm married to daughter Dresden Asimin Dami. We have two children. Thank you very much. Honourable members, you may now ask. Yes. Um, Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to congratulate my, my good friend, Honourable Dr. Dami, on his appointment. I take note of the fact that by virtue of the date of birth, you're likely to be one of the youngest attorney general, yeah. if not the youngest. I think it's a significant you know, occurrence that one must take into cognizance, having regard to the fact that the legal profession 
you know, is one that deals with a lot of experience and age. That um, minded by Article 79 of the 1992 Constitution, as I want to premise all my questions, you know, with this in mind, which states, Mr. Chairman, with your indulgence, I will read. The President may, in consultation with the Minister of State and with the prior approval of Parliament, <laughs> appoint one or more deputy ministers to assist the Minister in the performance of his function. My emphasis is on the assist. Now, that notwithstanding, I'd like to find out a few things about you to the extent that you were involved to assist. Then you can uh, answer these questions for me. Now, for the committee, the former special prosecutor, in his report on the Japan transaction, made reference to the mandate agreement. And he raised a few issues. One of which is the lack of capacity of the former Deputy Minister for Finance to execute the agreement. And two, that the agreement should be one of the agreements that comes under Article 1815. That also requires prior parliamentary approval as well as the approval of the Public Procurement Authority. Now, do you share that view of the Special Prosecutor? Mr. Chairman, thank you very much um, for the question. Indeed, the Special Prosecutor the former special prosecutor. The former special prosecutor. But the by mention special prosecutor as referring to the office of the person. So carried out what he termed risk analysis of the risk of corruption and anti corruption assessment of the processes leading up to the request for Cuba and approval of the transaction agreements and tax exemptions granted the under in relation to the good practice for monetization transaction and the Minerals Income Investment Fund Act 2018 at 978. Another related matter there too. The chairman, I put here the full title of the work because it, the context in which the exercise was carried out must be made clear. And the special prosecutor indicated that he was acting um, in line with what he described as risk assessment. It is worthy to indicate that in Act 959, the Special Prosecutor Act, explicitly, the exercise described as risk analysis or um, assessment of corruption risk is not indicated. The only clue a person may have as to the set of functions that the Office of Special Prosecutor has been given by Act 959. And the clue whether it includes a risk analysis is with regards to Section 2 of the Act. And in Section 2 of the Act, with, 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 with permission of the Chairman, if I may quote, that the object of the office is to A, investigate and prosecute specific cases of alleged or suspected corruption and corruption related offences, B, recover the process of corruption and corruption related offences, and C, take steps to prevent corruption. Indeed, it is pertinent to indicate that it is this C that the Office of the Prosecutor indicated to the public that he was proceeding under. So he considered the conduct of corruption risk assessment as part of the preventive mechanisms that he could deploy to curb corruption. Even though it becomes a matter of interpretation, whether well, it take steps to prevent corruption can include the conduct of such an exercise. I think that I will be liberal enough to say fair enough 
we could perhaps have come under this provision, we would have indicated that, yes, it's a debatable and discretionable. But the problem, fundamental problem that one may have is that, even though Mr. Mati Amidu indicated that he was conducting risk assessment, which of course will entail examination of a specific transaction and its future hazards that transaction may represent. Upon the presentation of that report, of course, it did not owe a duty at all to present the report to the president. I do not see anywhere in Act 959 that mandated the Solar Procedure to present all the report to, to the president. But that's the step he took. He presented a proper report to the president. And in doing so, he himself spelled out the rationale for doing so. The rationale for presenting a copy of the report was indicated by Sir Prosecutor in his letter to the President, dated 16th October 2020, as informed by the fact that whatever he did was supposed to guide future action. Come on, just uh, sorry. Uh, Minister Nominee, just hold your breath there. I'm indulging the chairman. You are saying that the special prosecutor was not required to present the report to who? To the president. To the president. To the president. He was not required. He was not required. Are you aware whether there was a referral from the president to the office of the special prosecutor? You have I'm any not indication? Aware. I'm not aware. You are he not aware. He indicated in his letter that he was carrying out the exercise the exercise of his mandate under section 2, paragraph C of Act 959. So that is the report. But the report. you are aware that the special prosecutor, if you read the act that you referred to, was independent on, on any matter. Yes. He could institute an investigation for the purposes of the general good of the country. Do you agree with that? I agree, and that's not okay, the you can continue. Chairman. Thank you. The chairman, and, and it's actually in line with that that I say that he was not obliged to present a proper report to the president. But he indicated in the re report that he presented the president that he was doing so because the exercise that he was carrying out was only supposed to guide future executive actions of government. And for that matter, he did so. Now, the issue, the little fundamental issue I have is that if a report of this nature is prepared and it's supposed to guide future executive actions of government. And same is presented to the president. And then, from upon the perusal of the report, there's no indication of a grant of a hearing to certain public officers. Honorable President General Nominee, was any of the people mentioned in the report contacted was any of the people mentioned in the report contacted or actors in the processes right. contacted according to the report sure. so the minister of finance was indicated there was also reference to the minister of finance in the report the point i'm making is that even though those persons were not given a hearing from the report and the Sula Prosecutor has indicated that that report was supposed to guide future executive actions of the President. When the report was given to the President, the President, of course, in accordance with the requirements of Article 296, which enjoins a public officer to act reasonably, requested the public the officer in question, that is the Sula Prosecutor, to grant the affected public officer a hearing. Then, surprisingly, the Sula Prosecutor pursued that request of a hearing to be an interference in his work. And so he resigned. That's my first point. Now to address my... my Chairman, my, just my, so he resigned, are you attributing his resignation to that? Because yes, there is a formal correspondence yes. on his resignation. Yes, there is. Are you attributing his resignation of the Special Prosecutor, Martin Alambez, Alamis Amidu, to what? I just want to hear you for the yes. record. Mr. Chairman, Why is it then he resigned? What are you implying? Right. Mr. Chairman, he indicated clearly in the letter of resignation that he was resigning on account of the request of the president to as well, contact the Minister of Finance to give me a hearing. 
So it is, the letter dated 6 November 2020, by which the special prosecutor and is signed. And it's further, Chairman, you are it's further your submission that the special prosecutor did not hear persons affected by his report. Is that your submission to the South? That's true. That so, apart from the request for documents that he admits Thank of you. the Minister of Finance. So that is, I think, the unfortunate circumstance that characterizes the work of the South Hospital. Now, to specifically address the question asked by the Honorable Member, whether I agree with the finding of self prosecutor that the Deputy Minister for Finance then, such as Dubai, they don't have capacity to execute the mandate agreement. I respectfully disagree. I disagree because the capacity to execute a financial agreement has been indicated in the Public Financial Management Act. In there, we find that, Mr. Chairman, the capacity is given to the Minister for Finance or any person that the Minister for Finance may authorize. And in this regard, I may refer to Section 5. I'm sorry. Mr. Chairman, may I just, just to be... Right. That's why Section 5 of the, of the Public Financial Management Act indicates that, that a person with the capacity to sign agreements under the Act rests in the Minister for Finance or any person not below the rank of a director that the Minister will authorize. In the light of this, it becomes quite clear that the Minister for the Deputy Minister for Finance if he was authorized by the Minister for Finance, had full capacity to execute. Chairman, just, uh, just we are listening to Honorable, Kelly. Honorable committee member, don't permit us to do that. Uh, we appreciate your reference. You are entitled to your view. Capacity of a minister yes. and capacity of a deputy minister and capacity of persons identified in the Public Financial Management Act, as you have referred to, to yes. continue. I'm putting it in context. Right. So, <laughs> Within the meaning of Article 78 and 79 of the 1992 Constitution, the capacity of a minister, yes. the capacity of a deputy minister, and those that you have just referred to, continue. Right. That's I'm, very one, that's I'm very grateful for the allusion to section 79, uh, article 79, clause 1 of the constitution. Because indeed, that clearly will buttress the point that the deputy minister for finance, if he had been authorized by the minister for finance to undertake a special function, then the deputy minister for finance was duly authorized. Because the function of the deputy minister, as set out in article 79, clause 1, is to assist a minister in the performance of his functions. That is not in doubt. Then section 5. Section 1, paragraph C of the Public Management Act at 921. Simply as follows. First one, section 4, the Minister may see, acting on the advice of the Attorney General and subject to the approval of Parliament, enter into and execute an agreement on behalf of the government in relation to matters of a financial nature. So, primarily, the capacity to execute any agreement on behalf of the government of Ghana in relation to matters of financial nature, rest in the Minister for Finance. Now, the provision goes ahead to stipulate in subsection 2 that the Minister may delegate any other responsibilities under subsection 1 to the Chief Director or to a senior public officer not below the rank of a director within the ministry, but shall not be relieved of the ultimate responsibility for performance the delegated responsibility. That's why I do not in doubt that a deputy minister is definitely above the rank of a director. And therefore, if a function under Section 5, which is to execute any agreement of financial nature, has been so delegated, I think that that delegation is, is proper. Further, in terms of execution of contracts, financial um, contracts, state contracts, there is also what we call the State Property and Contracts Act. 
The State Water and Contracts Act also authorize, authorizes the minister, in respect of a specialized matter, or a person that the minister may delegate that function. To Can I just, contracts. just for my record, quote the act number and then the year execution of contracts? What you are referring to for our purposes, Chairman? Chairman, the State Property and Contracts Act of of nineteen. Hello, that's right. That's right. CA6, 1960, CA6 is an old law. And it still plays in section 2 as follows. Just, just read the rendition full so for me, CA6. State Property yes. and Contract Act. Okay, thank you. 1960, CA6 is an old law. So the point that has been made is that even before the enactment of Act 921, authorization to execute government contracts is set out in law. And that authorization in section 20 of CA 6 goes as follows. It says the minister responsible for a subject or department. Any other person authorized by the minister may execute a contract for on, and on behalf of the Republic on a matter falling within the minister's portfolio. So the operative words here are the minister responsible for a subject or a department oh, no, oh, no, or any no, other no, person. I think, I think you are responsible for this matter. So I believe, I believe that finding, with all respect, is not entirely accurate. That's my humble opinion. And indeed, I may also add that the Spiller Prosecutor, in the work that he did, essentially was expressing an opinion on a contract, part of which had been approved by this Honorable House. Thank you. So if you are expressing an opinion, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? What am I doing now? Yes. That's why I'm expressing an opinion on his opinion. Thank you. <laughs> Based on the questions that have been asked by the Honorable Member. Yes. Your mic. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Now, some have held a view that the position taken by the former Attorney General, your immediate past boss, is that of one that is against the transaction. Are you able to confirm whether that is the position? The opinion is one that, that's what? Against the transaction. That's one, I think that may be respectfully a little bit of And you know going to take. I say so because the Attorney General's opinion on the matter, as far as I'm concerned, is a final one given on the matter. Now, there were a series of transactions, and I think I'm also placed on record that in, in terms of actual work on the Japan transaction, I was not part of it. I was not part of it because of the schedule of work and the Attorney General's department. Work is assigned by the minister, as the honourable minority that indicated. The deputy minister says the minister and work is assigned in that court. But even though I was not part of it, I've had the opportunity of examining the series of attorney general's opinions delivered on the transaction. And I would say that the first one that came to my attention was the one dated 1st April 2019. And you would note that the first opinion dated 1st April 2019 was actually um, for the record opinion by who by the attorney general name for attorney general, my boss madam Gore Kufu. proceed sir chairman and it, that opinion constituted an examination of a draft agreement and in the better course of a lawyer's work whether in private practice or public service if your client has a draft agreement, and the draft agreement is presented to you for review. The lawyer will conduct a preliminary assessment of the agreement and deliver an initial opinion. After, the lawyer may recommend to the client to undertake certain changes or amendments in relation to certain draft uh, provisions of the agreement. And that's exactly what the attorney did in this case. The attorney general delivered her first opinion on 1st April 2019. And as I indicated, it constituted 
preliminary observations and recommendations. And the first one contains certain general comments. Um, part of it will indicate that she recommended that there be insertion of this provision or that provision, and that even certain provisions would infringe on the exchange laws of the country and be um, taken out. Chairman, may I request of you that if the nominee wants to quote verbatim from it, would appreciate it, or we have an assurance that he will tender the same evidence right. to our committee for our purposes. But if you can emphasize the areas to which, when you say general and specific, we are not holding it to follow you. So for our purposes, we need to be guided. And okay. then, if you, you just give the date of 1st April 2019. If you have the date of the second and third opinion, just give it to us. And then I take chairman's uh, lead that you would make those documents available to us. That's and then my is, you, are, you share the view that Gloria Akufu respected Attorney General as she then was, did this within her mandate under Article 88 of the Constitution. Do you share the view? Fully. I fully share the view, and I also will add further that the first April 2019 letter by the letter that changed her did not constitute a final opinion on the matter. And Mr. Chairman, um, if I may quote from the first paragraph of the letter, it says, we have reviewed what the letter is referred to a letter dated so and so. In the second paragraph, we have reviewed the document as well as the relevant law and make the following observations and recommendations. So whatever follows constituted recommendations based upon her initial review. The chairman, I'm prepared to tender that document if, if I'm requested to do so. Then there was a reply from the Minister of Finance. The Attorney General looked at the Minister of Finance's reply and wrote another letter dated 28 May 2020. That's the first paragraph indicates. Come and just clarify, letter or opinion? The first, you said opinion, first April 2019. Yes. This one, is it a letter or opinion? What is your description? It was further observations contained in a letter. Okay, thank you. So, the change your route to another letter, further bringing to that Minister of Finance's attention more observations that she had made of all the Perusa. Oh, I'm sorry, the date, the federal observations. And the it date. was dated 28 May, 28 May, 28 May, 2020. 2020. 2020. But the reply from Minister of Finance came on 18th March, 2020. Thank the first you. letter by the Attorney General compared the Minister of Finance to undertake a review of the transaction. And I believe that it took quite some time. So they delivered their reply about six or seven months later on. And that was dated um, 18th March 2020. So it's changed up by this letter, 28th May 2020, replied. And it's also available. And Mr. Chairman would note from the comments that it again did not constitute a definitive opinion on the matter at all, because it contained only further observations and requests for the alteration of certain provisions of the transaction. And that thing you indicated a satisfaction of certain things that had been explained to her, pursuant to the letter that she had earlier on written. So, that chairman, that is also there. The Minister of Finance, a month later on, replied to another letter dated 22nd June 2020 and brought to the Attorney General's attention further amendments to the transaction documents. The chairman, that can also be um, tended. And the Attorney General conducted further review of the agreements that have been made again, and by another letter dated 22nd July 2020, also furnished further comments which will aid a revision of the transaction. So it's also signed by Boss, Madame Gloria Kufu, dated so uh, that can all, all be tended. The chairman, there was another letter written by the Attorney General 
dated 5th August 2020. And that, as far as I know, was the last correspondence from the Attorney to the Minister of Finance before the President's directive that the transaction be looked at again. So, the chairman, in terms of the observation by a person that the Attorney was opposed to the transaction, I believe that that is egregiously wrong. It's very wrong and must be corrected. Indeed, all I have before me a series of letters containing observations written by the Atangera, most of which were incorporated into the revised drafts that were undertaken by the Minister of Finance. Can I just a little way. clarity? So by your submission so far that I have followed religiously, are you seeking to disagree with Attorney General Gloria Akufu? Or you are leaving a thesis that she was not opposed to the transaction. What are you seeking just man, for purpose of clarity? Gentlemen, indeed, I stand with all respect by everything Madam Gloria Kufu did in respect of this transaction. And I'm not opposed at all to anything she did. Second, I'm only indicating for the record that the attorney general, Madam Gloria Kufu, at that time was never opposed to the transaction. And that is clearly discernible from a perusal of all the documents before me. And her final letter actually was an indication, I think it's very important to note that the final letter written by the Attorney which I indicated, 5th August 2020, comments as follows. The opening paragraph was referring to our various advice dated. So he, she indicated our various advice dated 1st April 2019, 28th May 2020, 22nd July 2020, and the transaction advices comments dated 12th June 2020 and 22nd July 2020, respectively on the Kingdom Investment Arrangement for Proposed Monetization of Mineral Royalties. And the second paragraph says, we note that the TA, that the transaction advisor, has incorporated some of our previous comments into the agreement, whereas he has raised issues with others for our reaction. We have studied TA's responses and comments as follows. And then she made further observations and comments. And those observations, as far as I'm concerned, usually were cast um, I mean, conditionally, that if this can be done, then this will follow. I believe that when the committee looks at it, the committee will better appreciate of the position I've taken. Yes. Are you done? Your mic, please. Uh, nominee, your mic. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, beyond the uh, Ferrari and then Ignition that greeted the Ejafat deal. And all that you know and all that you have told the committee, do you see any vitiating factor, anything that will vitiate this contract, or you think is perfectly impeccable in the language of Right Honorable Peter Madede? Perfectly impeccable. Yes, the right honorable ability described as perfectly impeccable. I'm not sure. He's saying the language of means he's referring to something else he has said earlier. Okay, so where is that he used to? <laughs> he very much loved. Mr. Chairman, I, with all respect, cannot see any vitiating factor with regards to the transaction. Um, I think I may place on record that. Uh, Chairman, Chairman, just for a record, the Honorable Tampuli used the word vitiating to a contract. In your answer, you are saying vitiating to a transaction. Where's matter for our purposes? What word do you want to use for the purpose of vitiation? Right. Chairman, there may ask clarity with regards to which of the contract, because there are a number of transaction documents. Is it the mandate agreement? Is it the mineral royalty agreement? On the records, I'm referring to the mandate agreement. I'm referring to the mandate agreement, just for the records. I'm very grateful. Gentlemen, in terms of the mandate agreement, the, there are three major factors that were cited by the former special prosecutor as 
a raw material as constituting restricting factors. Now, the first one is the lack of capacity of the Deputy Minister for Finance to execute the transaction that I've addressed. And I will not bore the committee with further comments on. The second observation was with regards to the alleged unconstitutionality of the mandate agreement. And Mr. Matiamidu contended that to the extent that 